All right, teammates, 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 we are back once again. If this is your first time listening to the Move Swiftly podcast, welcome to the number one show on innovative teamwork. Thank whoever brought you here. Shout out to shout out to Pod Match again. You guys are doing it. I was just telling my guests before that, you know, because of Pod Match, it has brought back a lot of the, the guest elements that I had to this for this show when I first started. To my regular listeners, you already know what I'm about, right to the point. And today we are you are in you are in for another treat. You're in for another treat because we're gonna learn all about systems and the importance of systems in your business, the importance of utilizing your CRM, utilizing your scheduling, utilizing the technology that's made for you. And in turn, you're also going to get a, a huge lesson on entrepreneurship and actually what it takes to be in business and how to make sure your work environment is, is doing the things that it's going to be conducive to development. So with all that, it's John Burdett, the founder of Fast Slow Motion. Welcome to the Move Swiftly podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm very honored to be on. Yes, and let's just get things started off now because, you know, you. I was listening to you on previous shows and you were the first to admit that, look, it didn't happen overnight. You made a ton of mistakes. You did things in college. You know, I mean, I think you actually used the term that you're almost the were you didn't feel like you didn't even deserve some of the things that you got right out of college. So I think right. it's good to kind of just start off with your background, how you, you know, how you started in this business and you know what what uh what happened since then. So let's I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in technology my whole career. Came out of school as a software developer. Uh and like most most people coming out of school, uh, you don't really know a lot, and you really don't know um, what you want to do when you grow up. But you know you're pointed in a direction, and I was blessed to join a, a firm that was about 15 people, and uh, we were writing code and building systems for large enterprises. And uh, as you mentioned, I, I got the opportunity to make a lot of mistakes and learn learn how the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things. And they gave me a lot of freedom and uh, responsibility. Like I said. Uh, that you said too, I, I didn't necessarily deserve. So um, that's how I started my career. And as a result of that, uh, the fast forward is I fell in love with building businesses because I got to do it a part of that company. And um, that's what I've been doing over my careers, building software related businesses, both on the product side and the services side. So when you were, what year did you graduate school, college? I got out of college in 2000. So this is my 24th year of being in, in the industry. Okay, so 2000, I'm trying to think back. This was before social media became a thing. This was before people became so heavily dependent on technology. What would you say then were like the biggest challenges compared to then to now 24 years later where, I mean, God, geez, you, you say no technology to somebody now. <laughs> it's almost like they don't know what to do. So talk about a little bit about the differences in terms of what the challenges were in 2000 to the challenges that are uh, in 2024. Yeah. So back then the internet was fairly new. Uh, it was, you know, the, you, people may remember the dot-com bubble and right. all these, everybody was building websites and web properties and all, all those, those kinds of things at the time. Uh, and you had to build most of that stuff from scratch. So there wasn't a lot of frameworks and, and, and applications that allowed you to do things. So even, you know, the biggest difference now is all the larger enterprises had a huge competitive advantage or heavily funded businesses had a huge competitive advantage because hmm. nobody could afford AWS didn't exist. We you had to you, you had to buy and maintain your own servers. Uh, wow. You had to build your own applications from scratch. And nowadays, you know, you can rent and lease all of these great tools. So you can focus on building your business and building your business model. So it was really nice to kind of grow up in that age because I got to learn how to, you know, make the watch and, and instead of just tell what time it was i could understand yeah. how everything worked um and honestly it, it helps me appreciate all the tools and things that we have today that we didn't before uh back when you just had to do everything by hand you had to have a lot of money and you had to it took a lot of time to get to where you wanted to go so okay so when you're when you're now you're graduated college and you're working for these firms when did it start to hit you that you were ready to branch out on your own and then what were the challenges that came with that? Because as you're talking now, I'm thinking, man, there's just a lot of competition in that space. It's just a lot yeah, of, yeah. you know, coding, whether it's this app, that yeah. app. And then me as a consumer, someone that is fairly intimidated by technology, I don't know what I'm paying for. I mean, I, yeah. I 
look, I just, as long as I see the website, then I'm good. But someone like you, it's kind of hard to figure out how do I get with someone like you and, and yeah. make the right decisions. Yeah. So I, I became more self-aware of who I was and what I was good at about 10 years into my career journey. And what, what really kind of started happening is I'd help build up a business and I get really bored and frustrated with the next right. level of growth because it was more managing and, and job type activities exactly. and uh, i love the building aspect like you said deciding on the systems the processes the tools onboarding the people watching them thrive you know kind of doing that design of the business and watching it scale and so that's where i fell in love with entrepreneurship so about six years into that journey i um a friend of mine um asked me to join him out of his house to start a product company he had already got it off the ground and uh, so I joined him as a partner. And so I was like, I'm going to build a product company now. And so we did that as well. Did that for so, about six look, years. I don't, and I don't mean to cut you off. When you say yeah. product company, is it like the computer, like the actual computer or a product on websites or like software like, products? So software it was uh, the name of the company was called Ticket Biscuit. So okay. we were the first white label ticketing solution. So back then, really only Ticketmaster existed. Mm -hmm. You had a few other competitors, but they did everything the same. They they controlled all the fees. They sent you to their website mm -hmm. and we built a solution. So a venue or a comedy club could run their own ticketing system on their own website wow. mm -hmm. without having to use Ticketmaster. So we were the technology behind that mm -hmm. and they were able to promote and send people to their website versus mm -hmm. Ticketmaster. Yeah, they could control all fees. Right. They they could control all pricing and they can do everything themselves. So we um we did that and um that was the product that we created. Right. Nice, nice. And then how did that did that blow up for you or how how did that work after? Yeah, I learned a lot of lessons in that business. So um, we were the first to do a lot in that industry. Um, I um I learned a lot about industry dynamics and you know, these big businesses and, and, and the entertainment industry and stuff like that. It learned also too, that the best product doesn't always win. And um, funding is really important if you want to grow fast, especially if you're competing against a big behemoth like that. So mm -hmm. we did really well, but we did everything organically. Uh, our competition uh, raised a bunch of money yeah, and uh, you know we had the better product, but they had more capital, and so they eventually overtook us. Long story short, we were very successful, but not nearly as successful as like a a Ticket Fly or Eventbrite and some of these yeah. names that you probably heard was, of. It was also events that, so it wasn't just okay. I got you. I got so man. Yeah, so right yeah, we were pre Ticket Fly, we were pre Eventbrite, right. all of those, and uh, they raised you know two hundred fifty million dollars and stuff like that, and mm -hmm. and really kind of passed us. But we ended up successfully exiting the business mm -hmm. and uh we sold it to um uh etix out mm -hmm. of out of the carolinas and so it was a, it was it was a big win um but i learned a lot along the way and it was definitely a, a challenging journey to build a, a successful product company with all that competition and with all these kind of outside market forces going against us right there's a well there's there's a huge lesson there that i want to make sure i re-emphasize to the listeners when it comes to actually what is a win and what is a loss all right a win is actually doing what it is you love doing all right a win is actually processing through it understanding going through the process and doing it creating the thing that you're going to create he said nothing of i mean he mentioned money in terms of selling the product but you mentioned there were other companies that were doing it as well but learning the process of doing that go do that all right go do yeah. that and then figure out okay how you now you're in the game because there's so many people that think okay i'm going to get in the business i'm going to try to try to sell something that nobody else sells no go and figure out go preach to the choir do what you have to do and then as you learn that process now you can look at yourself as an equal in the game so i'm sure you look at eventbrite now and say look i could do that like you know what i'm saying like it's one of those things where you see yourself as equals and it doesn't this is why i, I reference sports a lot it doesn't happen if you don't get out there get your ass kicked a little bit go told to tell my coach used to tell me all the time go get your feet wet go do something <laughs> so you can compete and it's the same way in business it's like get out yeah. there compete and then you'll figure something out even if you do get you know take off the map by a, a just a bigger opponent that has more money you try it and then hey you get to try again and get, you get to try again <laughs> yeah you you hit on a lot of my passions and things i've learned i've learned that you know you can't have destination disease the the joy is in the journey 
yeah uh, the joys in the grind and and just like you know all great athletes they love to practice they love to work out they love being in the gym and they love playing the games don't get me wrong but the joys in the grind yeah. and if you're not finding joy in the grind not every day is gonna be great but more days will be better than than others right. um that's what you want to do because you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna stick to it you're not gonna quit and and like you said there's there's nothing worse uh, than building a successful business that you hate. People are like, oh, you've got all this money and you're, you know, these customers and all that stuff. But if you're miserable, you're trapped in that business. It's almost, I, I say it's better to fail early than waste your life doing something you don't enjoy doing. So that, that was honestly one of the biggest lessons I learned out of that business. I loved our, our people. I loved everything that we built. I did not enjoy the entertainment industry right. uh, and all the, the nuances that go with it. And um and, and, and so that's when, you know, when I started fast slow motion, I was like, I'm going to really build a business I love mm -hmm. and I'll find a way to make money doing it right. instead of chasing a money goal or market goal or an opportunity or coming up, trying to invent some new idea. Cause yeah. like you said, do what you love to do and find a way to add value to the marketplace. They will vote with their dollars and reward you with cash and profits and things like that. And, right. and that'll be the result of doing what you loved. And that's just also on another note, because I had a previous guest that was on and he works for Live Nation uh -huh. and we're talking about Live Nation and how their ticket sale processes and stuff like that. And it's entertainment. But as I was talking to him, I realized he could be at these concerts. He's not necessarily enjoying himself. He's making sure the lighting is fine. He's making sure, you know, everything is being played on a certain time. And while everyone out there is enjoying themselves, having fun, they partying. But he's just making sure that this LED, like this ad goes on this time and or there's a there's a process to everything. And that's what that's where I want to kind of go to next in terms of when you decided to build fast and slow motion It's like. I get, did you partner with Salesforce and did you partner with HubSpot and how did these partnerships start to come about? Because CRM is very important, but it mm -hmm. has to be used the right way. All right, That's I'm exactly right. Personally in my business is you can, you can pay for a CRM all day. If you got no lease to put in there, you're just wasting your money every month. Yeah. All right. So how did you, yeah. you know, manage those partnerships and create those connections? Yeah. So first and foremost, I'd use these systems uh, to build, to, to scale my own businesses, those other businesses I talked about. And mm -hmm. so I, I was a client and I used it and I had success and, and really using Salesforce to run our entire business, not just a portion of it. And so that's, that's where, and, and I, like I said, I'm a builder. So I love the process. I love the system. And then the CRM tool like Salesforce and HubSpot are the tools that do that. So when I started the business, my our mission, is, and it's the same today, is to be a blessing to business leaders as they grow and scale their business. Because, it, you know, once again, it's the, one of the most difficult things you'll ever ever do, but can also be one of the most fulfilling things you ever do. Um, and, and you got to get there and do it, like you said. Right. And so I want to come alongside them and help them not make all the mistakes I made and, and really kind of focus on those processes and putting the technology tools in place. About nine months into the business, we were we were, we got it off the ground. I got it off the ground. It's completely bootstrapped. Mm -hmm. um, what I started realizing was I had to bring technology to the client. They weren't going to pay for, right. Let's find out which best CR, CRM is best for you and all this kind of stuff. And so we started bringing Salesforce to the table and, and say, okay, we'll put our management consulting and business consulting on top of the technology. And so about nine months into it, that started really working. And then Salesforce started sending us a bunch of referrals. So at that point I was like, okay, we're going to go to market as a, as a Salesforce consulting partner. Cause that's easy. I mean, you know, yeah. if you have Salesforce, like you said, most people aren't using it the right way or don't know how to use it or scared of it or whatever there is, right. we can come in and solve that problem. And Salesforce rewarded us with sending us deals. So it solved my sales and marketing problem. So at that point we went exclusive with Salesforce and then about a year and a half ago, we started doing HubSpot and, mm -hmm. and doing the same thing because it's a very scalable platform, just like Salesforce. Okay. Another, another major, major takeaway from that is I, I actually, it kind of reminds me too of when I used to work at a, have you heard of Orange Theory Fitness? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I used to be a sales associate there and there's thousands of gyms, guys, thousands of fitness facilities, especially out here in Florida. Orange Theory is like a Starbucks. And the one thing as a seller that we would always say is you got to sell the technology with it, sell the heart rate monitor, sell the fact that you could use this data to bring people in. You could use the scientific research and all those kinds of things. And 
the lesson that I want to make sure I reemphasize here is the partnership, guys, the referrals, the the fact that we're all in business together. And I think it actually even got said that uh, Facebook was willing to pay WhatsApp like billions, some ridiculous number, not because they couldn't do the technology, but because of the list of people that they had, the list of referrals mm -hmm. and the list of things that they can get. So eventually it gets down to working with people and what company is going to, what company you can partner with or refer yourself with or associate yourself with to make it so you get in front of more people. So when you when you had that conversation, whether it's with HubSpot or with uh, Salesforce, what was it about the people that they were bringing to you that made it so, okay, these are my ideal clients. These are the people I want to work with. And obviously, I mean, I was on your website earlier. You've built a, a pretty solid team. So like over a hundred people working remotely for you now. So That's obviously right. <laughs> we're bringing in, they're bringing in the right people. Yeah. That, yeah. So the way Salesforce goes to market and the way HubSpot goes to market is they have a direct Salesforce. So no matter if you're a one person company or you have 10,000 people, they have dedicated sales reps to you. So that was really nice for us because we love working with smaller growth businesses. We don't like, we don't work with large enterprise customers. So we like to help small businesses become big businesses and be that true white glove service for them. So the way they divide the market really worked well for us because they divide it by number of employees. So the, the, the market segments are by number of employees. And mm -hmm. so we could focus on the sales reps at Salesforce that sold into our demographic and our territories and partner with them. Yeah. And we were very unique in the fact that we didn't want to move up. We wanted to stay in this area. We mm -hmm. were also very unique in the fact that we weren't just technology order takers. We mm -hmm. were true consultants that would guide you just like a doctor when you're sick. The patient doesn't do, need to make the diagnosis. The doctor mm -hmm. does. You, you you can tell me your problems, but I'm going to help you put the right solution in place so that you get healthy uh, long term. And so we, we kind of solved that problem because most small businesses and most growing businesses, they're grossly underserved mm -hmm. and they uh, they still have major complex problems just like large enterprises. Right, right. So uh, are there any like examples that you have that you can share where you helped a small business become a bigger business that, you know, they came to you, they say, look, I got this problem, that problem. And then you actually diagnosed a bigger problem and then you were able to fix multiple problems like in one domino? Yeah, so we've been blessed to serve a thousand, uh, over a thousand clients now. So we've got a lot of case studies and a lot of, uh, of different examples. Uh, one of my favorites that I always uh, mentioned is uh, one of our clients uh, is, uh, is 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 they're they're called Brin Brinley Mountain Fire Apparatus. Uh, if you go to firetruckmall.com, they're the largest reseller of fire trucks in the world. Once again, it was one of those, I didn't even know that I'm existed. Telling you, like, I mean, and this is, what, yeah. this is what I love about business. Who would even think of a yeah. space like that? But you think it's about crazy, it, like, it? who's going to make multiple fire trucks, a brand new fire truck every, it's yeah. not going to happen. So they have to be resold. You know, you go in, that's, that's what yeah. I love about business, man. I, I love that. It's crazy. Aspect. There's always <laughs> something that you can tell. But go ahead. Yeah, totally. Yeah, go to the, go to the website, firetruckmall.com. It's, right. it's cool to check it out. But yeah, I mean, if you think about it, it's a massive problem um, because right. there's a ton of volunteer um, fire departments and smaller city fire departments that can't afford multi-million dollar trucks. So they've got to go buy used. Um, so we've been working with them for almost 10 years now. And when we first started working with them, they had built a little bit of their own technology to run their website and they were running everything on ACT. If you remember ACT, it's an old contact management system. And the rest of it was in spreadsheets. And so their leadership, yeah, their leadership was like, we can't keep, continue to grow and scale this way. And right. so we iteratively started implementing Salesforce to, to replace all those different technologies mm -hmm. so that now they run their entire business on Salesforce. So that website I just mentioned is actually running on top of Salesforce. They're entering the fire truck information into Salesforce and it's showing up on the website and they're managing all the inquiries. It's doing all the accounting. Uh, they have a whole service department. And so it's an iterative process where we just start addressing the pain points and eliminating systems, get all the data in one place. And then suddenly over time, I guess suddenly is not the word, but over time, you're starting to able to work on the business instead of working in the business, you're able to go on vacation again. You're able to be a better father, better, better spouse, better wife, better friend, because right. you have, you know, your business running, it's running consistently 
and it's making money and doing well and you know what's going on, but you're not having to monitor it 24 seven. Right now the, cause I, I, and that, well, first of all, that's a great, that's really a great thing that you mentioned because again, as a business owner, you don't want to be working so much to the point where you start to forget your personal life and your family life. You don't get into business. So you forget those things. You get into business so you can actually be a better father, be a better husband, be a better wife, things like that. And so the question actually I have for you, because you have so many, you have such a solid team. What is the, what is the criteria for anybody that may be listening that maybe want to help you know, your company be a part of it, whether they're an engineer, whether they have your background, what do you look for when it comes to uh, employees or potential employees? Yeah, we, uh, we have a very, after, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a very defined, and this is a the great topic of discussion because people in onboarding people, business, life is all about people. Business is all yeah. about people. If you're not building relationships and adding value to people, um, you're going to waste your life. And for, you know, really, you know, is the, is the bottom line. So, yeah. Um, we're all in the people business, no matter if you're professional services or you have products or whatever. And so we're very intentional about what we do and how we hire people. So no matter the role at the company, um, you first and foremost uh, have a conversation with our, our director of recruiting mm -hmm. and he vets to make sure that, hey, you're, there's culture fit, there's personality fit. And we hire around Patrick Lencioni's humble, hungry, smart mentality. Oh, okay. and, and we're looking at, you need to have all three of those. You got to have intellect. That's the given. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are table stakes, but you've also got to be humble and have humility and be willing to learn and grow and take feedback. Right. And then you've got to be hungry and the hungry aspect of it, you can't teach. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you're either motivated or you're not motivated. And right. so what we do, the first next step after, if you get through that first interview is we give you an assignment mm -hmm. and that assignment is very vague. Uh, and uh, that has some very detailed instructions on what to do next. So we're measuring your attention to detail and, and, and seeing how you problem solve and see how you do things. And you record a video presenting that assignment to us and our team reviews that. Mm -hmm. And so some people who aren't hungry don't even do the assignment, right? They're not even going to do those kinds of things. Right. And then we just build on from there. We do cultural assessments, behavioral assessments, cultural interviews, because, once again, you could be super smart and have all the intellect, but if you're not going to fit culturally into our environment where you have to have humility and, and you have to be coachable and be willing to grow, you're not going to, you're not going to fit in and you're going to be miserable. So very defined process there. i uh, glad to dig into any of those avenues or things that we do. Right. So as the, as the founder of the company though, this is now it's your name behind this. So this is very, very important for you. But the question I do have, though, because so much of what you have is remote, how do you create culture in a remote situation? Because usually, again, as, as a former football player, culture is in the locker room. We see each other, mm -hmm. push it, we love each other, we fight the whole thing, and you see us gelling as a team. How does someone do it remotely? Yeah, so we use teams. So we, we push the macro down to the micro. Mm -hmm. So everything we do is team-based. So every team member is a part of a team. Uh, so like if you hired us as a client to implement Salesforce or HubSpot, you're going to be dedicated to a team. It's going to be five to 10 team members. You're going to interact with two or three or four of them to help build out what we're doing and add value to you. That's led by a project leader. So that team is super close and they're working across 10 to 15 clients at a time. That right. team is literally talking to each other on video all day long, okay. either yeah, on client so calls or internal calls and stuff like that. So the team nature, just like you talked about that, they, they, they're just, they, they, the right hand knows what the left hand's doing. Yeah. You know, Scotty Pippen, Michael Jordan kind of thing. Going there you on go, baby. Because <laughs> they're, they're so t tight there. Oh, yeah. And we just put our processes and systems to ensure all teams are doing things consistently right? and following our processes and making sure they are perpetuating our culture because the culture isn't what I say it is. It's what we mm -hmm. do. Right. And those individuals are our culture. And so they have to live out our culture every single day. Mm -hmm. And they have to, we have to make sure that the people that don't are basically pushed out organically because the team won't put up with it. Just like a bad teammate, a good right. team will push that bad teammate out because they don't fit culturally so that's how we do it is we we push things down to the micro so mm -hmm. that you have the strengths of a larger company from you know 
process systems, connections, leads, money, all those kinds of things, but keep things as small as possible so that the team can add the most value because if they're not empowered, uh, we will not be successful. They have to be empowered because they are the ones interacting with the clients and, and, and making those clients happy. Yeah, that's the worst thing. And I've, I've experienced actually the, the problem with that. I was, when I first graduated from college, I was a scout for a company, National Scouting Report. And we were, I was, our job as independent scouts to go recruit players and mm -hmm. try to charge them for a service. And I'm sitting there watching a basketball player. One of the dads comes up to me and says, hey, I talked to one of you guys. You guys took $3,000 from me. I never heard from the scout <laughs> that previously recruited. And that hurts my business because yeah. I'm out with the same company. So I cannot reemphasize enough the importance of nailing down these systems particularly for you as the business owner. Right? I love the fact that you mentioned, hey, I'm it's my name now that's tied to this company. And if any client gets a bad review, like the one I just shared, now my company's at stake because I don't get to be interactive with this specific client. And these are things that you have got to make sure you do when you get into business. I've seen tons of people, tons of business owners just fail at this particular thing because in your own head, you have the vision to do what it is you got to do. But this, the people don't have that vision. There's people that you bring in, they just want to get paid. They feel like they deserve a certain salary. They get paid and, you know, they just do whatever. So it's important that you vet that out. And the, the next thing I, I definitely want to get into with you is like, you know, what's next? What, how do you see this shaping out? How do you see fast and slow motion, you know, being a part of the future and things like that right now? You can sort of talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we're highly motivated to keep growing and we love serving our customers, but we want to do that in a healthy way. <laughs> So we well, we measure that in three three main aspects. So we want to continue to grow so we can serve more customers and make you know have more of those Brindley Mountain Fire apparatus clients. That we yeah, serve man, that's a cool thing. Right. Yeah. yeah, I gotta, I, gotta so, that. I gotta check them out as soon as we're done. That's yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So if we're not making customers happy, nothing else matters. So as we continue to grow and scale and go from 120 people to 200 people to 400 people to 500 people, client happiness is non-negotiable and we got to keep doing that. Okay. Secondarily and equally important, our employee happiness is non-negotiable. So yeah. I built this company back in 2014 as a remote first company when nobody was doing that. And yeah. I wanted that so that they could enjoy life and work because we work a lot and we work really hard, but yeah. I want you to be around your family, your friends, be able to go to the gym, go mm -hmm. to the ball games, do all the things you want to do while you work hard and do it in an area of the world that you like to live in um, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. So we don't want to, to compromise our flexibility as employees and also just the happiness. If they're not enjoying the journey, um, we can't continue to grow and scale. And right. then finally, we got to be winning, meaning we got to be making money. So if we're growing and not making money, that's not sustainable. So right. making profit is not a bad thing. It's a, it's a result of doing the right things. And we want to make sure we consistently generate profit over time, because if we're not, that's a, obviously an indicator that we're going to grow and, and go out of business because you can definitely grow yourself out of business. So I'm highly motivated to um, grow our business because I love seeing our team uh, take on more responsibility. I love hiring people and seeing them thrive. I love hiring people and seeing them make a lot of money and enjoy the journey. And then most importantly, serve those customers. So I want to grow people up to stay, not grow people up to leave. And so we got to get bigger so that there are spots opened up for these great people that we're developing and mm -hmm. um, and serve more customers. So we're, we're, we're wanting to double again and keep keep doing it. But once again, only to do that the right way and making sure um, we're, we're healthy as we grow. Mm -hmm. And what would be the best if someone wanted to reach out and connect with you? What's the best way to do that? Yeah, check us out on the internet, fastlowmotion.com. All our social properties are there. Uh, we have a podcast as well. We have a lot of resources on our website. If you're interested in working with us um, or working for us, rather, there's a careers page that talks about all the things I just mentioned before. And uh, yeah, if you're if you're struggling implementing a CRM like Salesforce or HubSpot or don't even know where to start, we'd love to just help you. We're, we you know, we want to see if we can add value to you. And if we can't, we're going to point you in the direction of somebody that can. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So the way I close out all the shows, John, is I want you to use your imagination a little bit and the 
year, I say year 1999, 2000 version of John, just clicked in the Zoom room. He's, you know, going through all this technology stuff. He's a software engineer and not really sure if this is even going to be blowing up or anything like that. So pretend that that young man has come into the Zoom room. Just give him some words of encouragement and we'll officially close. Yeah, it's, first of all, he's going to be the most shocked person in the world. Because <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, never, never thought I would... Uh, you know, be blessed to run a company like Fast Speaking Solution. on a podcast. At that. Yeah, be on a podcast, right? <laughs> um, but no, I, yeah, I think the encouragement would be is 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 really focusing on being self aware of who you are and what your strengths are and what God called you to do, um, mm -hmm. and not not just chase the money or chase the success or chase the things that we kind of get caught up on when we're when we're younger. So I think self awareness is a superpower. And it took me about 10 years to get that, but, um, that, that would be the, the, the main thing that I, I would focus on. And then the, the next thing, as we talked about before is people are what matter. So if you get to where you're going and you, you, you kind of blow up all your relationships and you, 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 you burn all your bridges along the way, it's not worth it. So, um, mm -hmm. you can get there with great people and add value to people and be successful at the same time. Yeah, that, that's actually the self-aware piece is, is a very vital thing because as you become self-aware, you're right. The people that you're around are going to, it's going to be very obvious who's going to take you where you want to go yeah. and not going to take you where you want to go. So the self-aware sure. people in that order, all right? All that being said, appreciate you coming on. This has been a blast, man. I'm looking forward to, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to keeping more in touch with you and, you know, your company and what you do, because obviously there's so many unique businesses that you work with and that's, yeah. I'm all about that. I'm always interested in hearing more about that kind of stuff. So all that being said, fellow teammates, continue to move swiftly. We will talk more soon.